All right, yo, yo, everybody. Here we are live on an, another uh, Mind Body Marathon podcast. And on our show today, we have uh, Dr. Matt Pisanelli. And Hello. to my left and on my right, we have uh, Antonio Coleman, who is our sprinting specialist in the area. He's a, a genius when it comes to uh, Game Speed, which is literally the name of his company, Game Speed Performance. And um, we have him on here today to kind of help uh, slow guys like me and Matt <laughs> to try to get faster and stronger and and some tips and cues on that. So um, without further ado, go Antonio, go and uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, I'm Coach Antonio Coleman. I uh, coach uh, at Game Speed Performance Academy. I'm also the head coach at Warrensville Heights High School uh, for track and field for both males and females. <clears throat> um, I just kind of talk about, you know, how I got started with track in the first place or how I got started with coaching. Uh, when I got started with track, I think I was 12 years old. And um, I started seventh grade and I wasn't that good. Um, I was best place. I think I came was like third from last. <laughs> and uh, what were your events? Uh, my event was the 200 and 400. Okay. 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 Uh, <clears throat> and now I'm a hurdle specialist, but I'll get into that. <laughs> but um, I, I, I came in and, and I was running and we were running on cinders. I'm a little bit older than these guys here. So we were running on cinders. It wasn't no all weather tracks around us. Lakewood, I think was the only all weather track yeah. that there was. Um, so we ran on cinders and I, I think my best time was maybe 63 seconds in the 400 and 26 in the 207th grade. Um, that summer, I was really upset with myself about not being very good at track. And I was pretty decent at football and other sports, but track, <clears> I just wasn't. So I was upset because I wasn't good at track as I was other sports. Mm -hmm. So that summer, um, I went and uh, we moved. And when we moved, we moved down on Martin Luther King Drive, in a street called Forest, stayed on 104th and Forest. You guys know what This is in Cleveland. Yeah. yeah. So when you go down from Forest, you go down the hill, becomes Lamentier, and it's a long hill. This hill is 375 meters long. I did not know that at the time. <laughs> I was going to say, that would have been freakish if you knew that. <laughs> I did not know that at the time. I went back and measured it. And I went down to the bottom of the hill, and I said, I'm going to get to the top of this hill at full speed before the end of the summer. So I went down. I would run the hill two times a week, three times a week if I can. And I made it up to about a quarter of the hill. And I was like, man, this is going to be really hard. <laughs> <laughs> so I kept going and kept going. And by the end of the summer, I was able to make it up running what I thought I was doing full speed yeah. up the uh, up the hill. And so this was my only knowledge that I had of me getting faster. It's actually really good intuition that you mm -hmm. thought to do that. And so I um, came back the next year and I went to Gallagher Middle School. And in Gallagher Middle School, I was undefeated in the 400. <laughs> nice. <laughs> um, I ended up being the uh, city <clears throat> champion with 54 seconds in the... Uh, uh, almost a nine second difference. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, I contribute that all to hard work. And now that I'm learning and understanding how the body works and how the fascia works and everything like that, I took 11 months to change my whole yeah. body and how it ran and what it did. And my body was so prone for change because I was only 13, 14 yeah. years old. I was still growing and everything. So I was so prone and change at that time that I was really teaching my body to be faster and stronger while yeah. I was being faster. <clears throat> the great thing about hill training specifically in that environment um, is that it requires, so like basically when we're doing like max VO2 tests on people, mm -hmm. there's uh, two types of protocols you can do. Mm -hmm. So this is basically getting somebody on the treadmill with a mask and you're getting them to run to exhaustion. You can do a speed based protocol or you can do an effort based protocol. And typically a speed-based protocol is harder to do because most people can't run to the well genuinely. Mm -hmm. But if you do an effort-based protocol, you kick up the incline on the treadmill and you force them to work much harder than they're used to just in general because running hills just requires a much larger recruitment of the muscle mass, which will tap you out quicker. And that's such good logic on your part to just challenge yourself in that way. You know, we all know it's harder to run up hills and it's kind of like, duh. But when you actually train that way, you are literally create, increasing the neuronal pool of activation of that muscle. So it's pretty awesome that you did that. When you were training, were you doing it more based off of effort or were you doing it where you time yourself to yeah. get to the top? And I you didn't just know try how to, to time myself. That's awesome. 
I just, just wanted to get to the top. Yeah. I just wanted to get to the top without stopping or slowing what I felt was slowing down. Mm -hmm. So when I was at full speed and I was going, I was going, I was going, I was going, then I, oh, this is just it. Yeah. That's yeah. all I got. And I was able to run and then run beyond it because the hill then levels off. When I was able to get to the top and level off and still run, I said, that's when I felt that I was ready. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, okay. So taking that, you know, all the way back from how you were training in eighth grade, taking that to now. So what are some kind of your, some of your current coaching philosophies and, and stuff that you've learned over the years with, with working with all these different athletes? I mean, you've worked <clears throat> with athletes from multiple levels of, of performance. Mm -hmm. um, with that, with that being said, just that knowledge of having that. And then I understand that I have to train people at their peak as long as I can. I want more, I'm a, more of a quality coach than I am um, <clears throat> having to, them to do a lot of volume. Yeah. Okay. I want to see quality. So, and I will have a workout made up. I'll say, okay, we're going to do three 250s, three 150s, and then we're going to do some striders, right? So I get to the 250s and they hit a certain time. And then on the second 250, they slow down. And on the third 250, it's like, whoa, I break it down to a 150. Mm -hmm. And then now I got a certain time that I want them to hit. If they're not hitting that time, I scratch the whole workout all together. Yeah, because they're they're obviously straining and and you right. kind of miss the the boat on performance there. Right, and so and that usually turns into injury if you don't. Yeah. So I allow them to just uh, come back down. Okay, we just we'll do something different now. I have to work you up to being able to stay at that level at that high. So I'll start them off with something shorter, as long as I can have them running at that peak performance, mm -hmm. especially when it comes to sprinters. Because sprinters don't like anything that they think is distance. And they think when kids come in, they think 200 is distance. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then they're all, also, you know, when you get into high school, they think 400 is distance. And so you have to make them understand that it's not. It's just another threshold of sprinting. Yeah. So you have to teach them how to do that. Plus the value there too is, is that, especially if you break their horizons, their horizons on what is considered distance, the value there is that, you know, it helps them in rounds you know, with like regionals and state, it helps them running meets back to back. It helps keep them twitchy over the course of the week rather than just one or two days of the week. You know, it just kind of increases that overall speed endurance component. Absolutely. Um, and that comes into competition as well. So I'm going to work on you being as twitchy and as quick and as fast as possible when I first get you, no matter what. So that's where I came in. I'm going to talk about one of my programs, which is barefoot speed training. And so barefoot speed training is you're going to come into my gym. I'm going to warm you up. Everything is you're going to have no shoes on the whole time. And I'm really going. So the first time that you actually um, work out with me, your, your feet is probably going to be pretty sore. Your calves are going to be pretty sore uh, because it really strengthens. The now, are, are you doing this with some of your NFL guys, too? And absolutely. Absolutely. So and I that's do. the other thing we should mention is that he's. Um, Tony was uh, proficient and and obviously we talked about his coaching aspect with high school and things like that and, and track and field. Um, but also, you know, you're working with a lot of guys getting into the combine, a lot of NFL guys, a lot of high level pro performance um, from baseball and, mm -hmm. and, and stuff like yeah, that. And I got a, a kid over now, um, Brandon, he's over uh, overseas right now and he's playing professional uh, basketball overseas and uh, he's doing very well. His coaches are very excited about him and all he keeps saying is, how did you get in such great shape? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then he and he tells, he, he calls him back and says, man, I tell everybody over here, game speed is going to be popular in Europe. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, sorry to interrupt, but yeah. so back to the barefoot style. So then you get him in there and. Yep. So I, I really, because I really want to strengthen the intrinsic muscles of the foot uh, because it's so neglected when it comes to running or doing anything. Because we, we do, we tie our shoes up, we get yeah. ready to run and we get running. So we don't really get a chance to really get the phalanges moving like they should. Yeah. Um, so I, I really want to get those things activated, strengthen those muscles. It helps with force application because that's what speed's all about. Yeah. And when you are confident in putting your foot into the ground, when you put some shoes on, even you're pushing even harder into the ground. Well, I mean, I, I use this analogy a lot with my patients. It's like um, your brain isn't stupid. It's not going to let you load beyond the capacity of the most distal structure, which is the most farthest structure. And the way to think of this is, Say you could theoretically lift 100 pounds with your biceps, but you could only hold 50 pounds with your hand. Well, you're not lifting 100 pounds then. You will only lift what your hand can hold. So if you're sprinting and your feet are weak and your feet are atrophied, then you, your body will not let you fully load the strength of the glute, the strength of the quads all the way through that distal structure. And it's just simply because it's just not strong enough. 
So that talks about when we talk about kinetics. When we talk about the kinetic chain, closed kinetic chain, open kinetic chain, when I put my hands or my feet onto the, to the ground, it knows that what, it has to move my inertia in some type of way. Mm -hmm. So with that being said, my body is not stupid. It understands that. So as I put my foot into the ground, when I do weight training, when I do weight training, I'm <laughs> the way that I do it is kind of unorthodox, what people would say. When I've, I've learned, when, especially when I went through uh, strength and conditioning in college and everything like that, push through your heels when you squat. I teach the exact opposite. You push through your forefoot when you squat. Because when you push through your forefoot, that's activating those intrinsic muscles, the ankle, the calves, the peroneal muscles. All those muscles are being activated now mm -hmm. when you're lifting. So then those become what? A part of that kinetic chain, making sure that it's stabilizing you while you're going up and down with the squat and you, you know, you're strengthening the quad and the glutes, but yet that when it's standing there and it's strong, it's holding itself. So that helps with ankle stiffness. Yeah. So when I have them lift and train and do things like that, they're going to do it on the forefoot. Most of the time when we do trap bar deadlift, forefoot, split squats, forefoot, I want to have them on the forefoot, pushing off the forefoot through it all. And then now with all that weight coming down, you have it on the forefoot everything is going crazy in that foot. And I love it because I understand that now he's going to have more stiffness or she's going to have more stiffness in that ankle and they're going to be able to push more off the ground and that's going to increase their speed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that's, um, that's a great uh, conversation point. I always tell people too, if you think about how the foot reacts to the earth when you're running or sprinting or the ground, it's kind of like when you're doing push-ups. If, if you close your hand and try to do a push-up, it's so much harder than if you just splayed your fingers. And if our feet are kind of locked in this position where they're not splayed, then we fully can't activate all those muscles you're talking about. But if we can splay them, like you said, the phalanges earlier, mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden you're going to be able to get a much better blossoming of the muscles farther up. Yep. And so I'm, I'm going to send you some videos too of them actually training and you can see how the foot opens up and pushes off the ground. And then you'll see them stay up on the forefoot mm -hmm. so high when they don't have any shoes on because mm -hmm. they're pushing. Because think about it. When we go to sleep at night, we get up in the morning and you first thing you do is touch your feet on the ground. Do you walk on your heels or your forefoot? Yeah. <laughs> it's like common. Yeah. <laughs> you walk, you get to the bathroom, you up on your tippy toes, try to get to the bathroom. Yeah. So it's a natural function, just like walking contralaterally. A lot of times people, when I'm teaching them <clears throat> different sprint mechanics, they'll do something lips a lot really do. Yeah. You know, uh, same arm, same leg. Mm -hmm. But when you teach them, it's like your body naturally moves contralaterally. Yeah. So all I'm teaching you how to, what to do is what God has already given you. Mm -hmm. And so that, that comes into the point of that I built the foundation of game speed on a scripture that is in the Bible, Corinthians 9 and 27. I discipline my body like an athlete, training it to do what it should. And then I always ask the question, what should the body be able to do? Whatever you discipline it to. And it's all about your discipline because I say now you're a chiropractor, but that's your discipline. Right. I say, when I, when I talk about a track and field athlete, oh yeah, I run track and field, but what is your discipline in track and field? Well, I run hurdles, that's your discipline. When you play football, you're a receiver. When I say you play football, you don't just play every position, your discipline is being a receiver. So like, so use that as an example. So if you have a lineman versus a wide receiver that's getting ready for a combine, how will you train them differently? The thing is, when you first start <clears throat> uh, uh, training them, I always look at, like I said, discipline your body like an athlete train them like they're infant, first of all. So all infants get trained the same. When you first start, you walk and crawl in on your, on, your, on your knees, and then they get up, they waddle a little bit, and as they can put more weight on their legs, they begin to walk. But then when they squat, they do a perfect squat. Mm -hmm. You ever watch a kid, you roll them a ball or something like that, and they're two years old, they do a perfect squat. You ever see them do deceleration, have them jump off a six-inch box? They decelerate almost perfectly. Yeah. It's almost intuitive in us. So I teach them certain small things like that, coming off a box, six inch box, showing them how to make sure that they're decelerating, accelerating uh, correctly, and they're stabilizing correctly. So then once I get those things, now my um, tra track was that my uh, uh, receiver, my receiver, he's going to do more sprinting, jumping, change of direction or whatever. And then I'm going to have my um, <clears throat> lineman is going to be doing a lot more pushing and pulling. And so now they're both starting off the same, still working on their speed, yeah. but speed for their particular discipline. Mm -hmm. hmm. So if somebody comes into your, your gym and they start out on those basis of 
you know, getting into the barefoot, getting into like the, you know, the, the building blocks of it, and then going into the sports specific portion. How long are you typically training an athlete in the base part versus when you start to get into the specifics? And yeah, I, like kind of essentially macro cycles. Yeah. yeah. It's an ideal world. I would like to stay in that for at least six weeks. Okay. I would like to. Uh, but that doesn't always happen because yeah. I get guys, hey, man, I got a combine coming up. Yeah, I mean, exactly. getting, there's, there's time requirements and stuff right, like that. Right, time requirements. So then I have to see then now we, we look at kids and we tell them, what, what is your sports age? You know, talk about kids yeah. at the sports age. I look at that when I'm talking about high school and professional. Like, what is your sports age? So uh, elaborate on that. So when they, when they come in, I can, once I do my assessment on them, I take them through different biomechanical movements and things like that. They can, it'll show me how strong their feet is. It'll show me how strong their ankles is, their hip complex, their knees. Once I see how strong there is, I can kind of push them ahead a little bit and start going towards some more sports specific if they're ready. But if I got somebody and they're shaky and they really don't have any foot strength or anything like that, I have to keep them in that longer. But everybody starts off in that infant stage and then some infants are a lot quicker than others and some are not. How much um, in your paradigm does coordination and, and just being a generally coordinated person uh, play a role in the strength? Coordination is the one of the foundations of strength, if you think about it. Um, <clears throat> when it when, first thing is, when I do the assessment, I say one, one of the things I'm assessing. I'm assessing your coordination, your balance, your mobility, your flexibility, and your general strength. You know, because you watch the Olympics, you watch the 100 in the Olympics, and it's like, yeah, all they're doing is running from point A to point B. It's not. And what I tell people all the time is like, that is actually the hidden variable because when you can coordinate your body well, then you also know how to shut off certain muscles. Mm -hmm. And then if you don't ever know how to even activate those muscles, then you don't even know how to shut them off. And then you're limiting yourself. But everybody knows how to do it intuitively. Yeah. If a bear came through there, you guys are no longer slow. <laughs> I guarantee you're not slow. Uh, <laughs> maybe. There's no maybe about no. it. No, this is true. And so, and so what we think about it is like, if anything happens, just like if something that you truly fear, if you fear something and it comes at you or come at you, and as soon as you see it, you're going to move fast. Now, how efficient you're going to be is different. And efficiency takes practice. It was funny. I was talking with a patient. <laughs> this is just kind of like uh, making me laugh a little bit because I was just talking with a patient earlier. <clears throat> and in a couple of weeks, uh, Zach and I, and supposed to be mad, but this guy got injured. Uh, we're we're going to do the rim to rim to rim in the Grand Canyon. And then this one patient was like, oh, yeah, last time I was in the Grand Canyon, they were talking about there was tarantula warnings because there were so many, there was like an overabundance of tarantulas in the Grand Canyon. And I'm thinking like a lot of our run will start at night. <laughs> and so I'm like, <laughs> I'm like freaking out. They're going to get like tarantulas on our head. <laughs> so that's going to make me run fast in the Grand Canyon. Oh, you better believe it. <laughs> you better believe it. But I'm just saying just all, because we think about it, it's only 100 meters, 10 seconds, 9 seconds or whatever. I can get, I can train anybody to run 10 meters fast. And how longer, how much more efficient you're going to be after that. Yeah. Okay. So. I would say that most of the throwers in the Olympics probably can beat most of the hundred guys out of the blocks because they're so explosive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good call. So if you put them in the blocks and they're able to get out the first five meters, they may beat a Usain Bolt or someone out of the blocks. But then after 10 meters, it's over. Yeah. But it's that explosion, that first, um, uh, uh, what is it called? Uh, ATP. Yeah. Boom, you're gone. So that's what I mean. But so now you use that to get get faster. So what I do instead of having a treadmill or something like that, I want to see how hard you can push into the ground, and that tells me how fast you can go. So I have what is called the free laps. I don't know if you ever seen the little free lap cones, but I have the free lap cones. I, I set them up, and I set them up ten meters apart. And then as you go past the cones, it tells me how fast you went and your miles per hour or meters per second, whatever one you want to look at. Mm -hmm. So my whole thing is is that. Um, I got bands like this that I'm getting made that are going to say 17 miles an hour, 18 miles an hour, all the way up to 24 miles per hour that they can earn. So they're going to push themselves to be able to get a band. So they're pushing You're going to have themselves. to go all the way down to like six, seven miles an hour yeah. for us. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and, but that is one of my first tests on the first day is I, as I, I have them do a fly 20 and it's a 30 meter run in. And then so then it gives me your top speed at the last one. And it tells me if you're at 15, 16, 17 miles per hour, 
and it goes from there. And then after I see that, I can see as it grows, I'll see how you can get faster or your potential of getting faster by how many miles per hour you can go at the end of that. Mm -hmm. So I have kids that will come in, they're doing 17 miles per hour. And by the time three months is over with, I have them at 20 miles per hour. Mm -hmm. So then now you have what's called a speed tolerance. So now you have a tolerance of speed. So now how can you now understand that I'm going to run a 400? So I could run a 400 at 16 miles an hour like it's nothing if I'm able to run 20 miles per hour. And that's how I'm trying to teach kids on how you run the 400 so they don't be so scared of it. Yeah. You can run, man, you can run 22 miles per hour. All I need you to run is 18 miles per hour all the way around. That's it. Yeah, that's good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's really easy to wrap your mind around if you put it that way. Right. And so then now as they, as they do that over and over and over again, I see them and then I break it down like this is what, what it would take for you to run a good 400. And then once they do it, they feel in their body like, hey, you know what? That wasn't that bad. And that's how I convince my 100 guys to be able to run 100. I mean, the 400. So you yourself are uh, a master's athlete. How old are you? 52. 52. <laughs> and you just recently started to get back in a competition, actually mm -hmm. competing. Yes. Because you've been training all these years, but now you're actually back to competing. Mm -hmm. And uh, what are some of the things you've learned through the process of getting you back uh, fit? Because a lot of our listeners are a little older and then maybe they're looking at ways to kind of increase their pliability, increase their speed, and or maintain their speed, I should say. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, what are some of the, what are some of the cues and dynamics that you learn from that? So the first thing is is that training for aesthetics to look good, to stay healthy, is different than training to compete. Um, I didn't really start until about three weeks out before that competition to really start trying to compete because, like I said, I like to do hurdles. So I was doing hurdles and then muscles were tighter places, hurting places that I haven't felt in a very long time. <laughs> <laughs> so actually trying to train for the hurdles and things like that, you have to actually do it. So now what I'm doing is I'm taking at least two to three times a week to do hurdle mobility and start doing hurdles and things like that to get ready for next year. Because I really am, am really serious about competing next year and trying to get myself up and, and at least I want to be in the top three in the world. Yeah. Would you go to the world champs? Absolutely. Yeah. Good. Absolutely. Absolutely. I had. Uh, we, we have the world champs coming up here. Oh, no, that's. <clears throat> we do, right? <clears throat> in 2026. 2026. That's right. Is it in Florida? Uh, Who's 20... hosting? Oh, it's Inspire. That's right. <laughs> so you, you got, I mean, it's in the backyard. You got to represent. That was the reason why I did it here. Because it was right at Bowling Wallace. Yeah. It was right in the backyard. I mean, I had, I had to represent. And so I, I didn't realize. I thought I was like way behind. And when I actually ran, now my time is like three or four in the country. And I'm like top 25. I think I dropped to like 26 or 27 now because uh, they're still running. Some of them were still running yeah. to uh, um, in the world. So I'm like, if I really got serious about this, I, I think I can be number one in the country and probably top three in the world. That's so cool. Now, would this be um, which event in the hurdles? Uh, it's the 100 hurdles. So it, it, it was 110 hurdles when I was younger. So now that I'm over 50, it's 100 <laughs> hurdles and it's 36 inches. Yeah, I, I can do that. <laughs> 39, 42 inches. Nah. <laughs> so you do train, uh, mm -hmm. you know, you have, um, you train regular class uh, people like, you know, mortals, essentially. Like... Is it mortals? <laughs> <laughs> Yes, so, um, I just started, actually, uh, we're doing what we call our adult classes. We say it's 35 and older, but there are some younger people that are 30 or 25 that would like to be a part of the class, which I'm not going to discriminate against. Uh, but I'm going to teach them, but still stand in the same philosophy is if you want to look like an athlete, you have to train like one. Yeah. And so you're still going to train like an athlete. You're going to be doing the sled pushes, pulls, box jumps, um, clean and press. You're still going to be doing the things that athletes would do, but it's going to be on a more moderate basis. And to get you start getting you back into shape. So, yes, absolutely. And I think it's to me, I think it's the only way you should train um, because just doing, I don't want nobody mad at me, uh, uh, just doing Pilates <laughs> <laughs> and step class. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, it's just not getting you ready to me, um, at what I call a warrior. It's not yeah. getting you ready for warrior status. Yeah. And I think that you can be ready for warrior status and that will get you to the aesthetics that you want. That's a byproduct. Your aesthetics is a byproduct yeah. of you truly working out and doing what you're supposed to be doing. So if you were working out, trying to be a hurdler, trying to be a sprinter, trying to be a 1500 meter runner, trying to be a marathoner, and you really getting it in, 
you're going to look like you want to look. Yeah. Yeah. That's a really good point. So say somebody doesn't have access to an awesome gym like yours and, and you know, they're, they're, uh, and they want to, to make some of these adaptations. What are some of the basic things you should, you would advise them to do? Um, it's very simple. It's not that hard. It's just that it's going to be a part of your dedication. And that dedication is that you have to do it on a daily basis. Start off with calisthenics. Push-ups and pull-ups still work. Mm -hmm. Squats, air squats, one-leg squats still work. Lunges still work. All those things work. So do those things, but try to do them on a daily basis. Get yourself a nice routine. If you want to do upper body one day, lower body, if you want to do it, um, both upper and lower body, what I do is a workout <clears throat> that I like to do is I like to do a push and pull workout. So I'll do push and pull horizontally. So I do everything that I got to do push and pull horizontally on that day. The next day I'll do push and pull vertically All mm -hmm. my vertical push and pulls. <clears throat> so, so give me, give us some examples of, of, of all of those movements. Okay. So today we did the workless workout. So, uh, it's another one of my programs, excuse me, uh, that, that we do. And, um, <clears throat> it's called multi-phase training because I like to train at all of the different, uh, muscle contractions. Okay. I like to focus on them. So today we're focusing only on isometric movements. So I call it the workless workout because <laughs> I like that. there's no work going on <laughs> because you're not actually moving anything. All right. So the workless workout was push up, push up position. You have to hold yourself at 90 degrees for 20 seconds. And we did it in like a Tabata form. Hold it for 20 seconds, relax, hold it for 20 seconds, relax for 10 seconds. Right. Mm -hmm. But to add a caveat to it, you have to do it on one leg, one leg. So now I'm really working everything intrinsically. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So now I hear I can feel it now inside my hip flexors, my abs, everything because I'm on one leg. Now to add even more to that, I had two medicine balls and one medicine ball on each foot. <laughs> <clears throat> so that's the next level. So now I'm working that, but now my body is now recruiting muscles because I'm inside that isometric phase. So yeah. now I'm recruiting muscles. I like to take my athletes through this type of workout once a week because it helps with the connective tissues. Mm -hmm. And so helping with the connective tissues, what a lot of people don't understand is that when you're trying to develop the belly of the muscle, it can take you anywhere from four maybe six weeks and you can start seeing some hypertrophy, but to get that connective tissue to catch up to that, that's another eight to 12. So now what I need to do, I need to make sure that I'm doing my restoration and make sure that I'm, I'm allowing that to catch up because you've seen it on them programs where guys are trying to lift a lot of weight and they tear their dang on peck because they got so much hypertrophy that, yeah. that those connective tissues never caught up. Right. And so we allow those muscles to caught up by doing isometric yeah. movements. <clears throat> so that's why we like to do the isometric movement. So then that's one exercise. And the other one would be a supine row again on a box, one leg all the way from your calves, all the way throughout your whole posterior chain. You're feeling this thing and you're sitting up there. You're shaking. <laughs> <laughs> and then we do a, a split squat. So you're on one leg, you're leaning towards the split squat, trying to really put the most of the emphasis on the one leg with the forefoot, with the heel off the ground. And you're holding yourself there again. And we're doing each one of these five reps each, and they're holding them for 20 seconds each. Mm -hmm. At the end of this, everybody's just laid out. Oh my just God. cooked. And I'll be like, <laughs> and, you're, and I said, we're doing the workless workout. What's wrong with you? <laughs> <laughs> and then we do what the last one is the hip up. Mm -hmm. So the hip up is a bridge, basically. You put your foot on the medicine ball, and then you only can push off the forefoot. You can't have your heel on the medicine ball, just on the forefoot, and you push all the way up. When I tell you, you feel that through every part of your calf and your hamstrings, and you're sitting up there, and you're shaking, just trying to look at them 20 seconds like this. I was like, come <laughs> on. <laughs> so we go through that, and then the last one we do is we do it on the forefoot. We're up, and we stay up on our toes, pushing, cognizantly pushing our toes into the ground, especially big toe, pushing it into the ground so that we're working all of those muscles, not only of the calf, but we're working that halicus. We're working the digitorums, and you're really pushing into the ground, and you still got to hold that for a minute. Yikes. Yeah. So in total, how long is that workout? That workout is probably about 45 minutes long. That is crazy. See, what I like about it is like your fascial system responds to long sustained holds. Mm -hmm. And when you keep, keep saying connective tissue and all that, that's kind of what we're alluding to. And so like it's really responded to like sitting as a posture and that's why it can tighten up and, mm -hmm. and things like that. 
And when you're doing those holds like that, essentially what you're doing is you're training the connective tissue and you're making it more dynamic. And you're allowing for your body to be able to access the full range of motion of that muscle, which is kind of what you were alluding to when like people like pull their pecs and stuff like that. It's like yep. they can be strong, but they didn't act, they're not able to fully access that muscle because it can't even cover the full range of motion. Right. Right. And so then I mix that, mix and match that up. Like I'll have a phase where I'll do just eccentric training where I'll have them do the movement eccentrically. Um, and then I'll go into the isometric with a concentric movement with it. So I have them do a pistol squat and you do a pistol squat and you have to hold it at 90 degrees, one, two, three, four, five. And then you have to give me two concentrically. And so you have to give me five of those each leg. Matt's worried about his kneecap. Just yeah. thinking about it. No, <laughs> it doesn't exist. <laughs> so no, uh, but, uh, right now I'm training a girl who had a complete ACL tear. She could not give me one squat off of that leg at all. She's been with me now six weeks and she's on the video that I just posted the other day <clears throat> and she's doing on the lever, on the lever squat machine, she's doing the pistol squat, the one, two, three, four, five, one, two. And when she did it, I was so excited. She was like, I can't believe I'm yeah, doing this. That's pretty phenomenal. Because it, 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 and, and so when, when she first came in, everything was eccentric and isometric but it was doing all the muscle recruitment and the connective tissues was getting so stronger, so much stronger that she just started really, her adaptation was great. Mm -hmm. She started to adapt and she started getting stronger and she started, she was really excited about it. So um, when I get those, I like to try to talk to the um, PT or whatnot and just see where did they come from, where they were, um, how they were progressing with them so yeah. I can see what their post rehab should look like. Um, but with her, it was, it was, it was awesome. And I've, I've had professional athletes like that as well. So I would really love to do some things with your, with your leg and see, you know, how it would progress. Yeah. I mean, Matt is, um, he's got, he's got stilts for legs. They don't, they don't move great. <laughs> <laughs> so this pliability and, and things like that would be really great for him. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. So everything we start off with, when we start off with our warm up, of course I said it's barefoot. So we get the ankles moving, the feet moving. We get the knees. Moving, I hear about your warm ups that the athletes I treat, they're like, dude, his warm up takes forever. It's so hard. And then you you don't you think that's the workout. And then the workout starts and you're like, What? There's more. <laughs> <laughs> and it's only 12 minutes. <clears throat> they think that it's oh my God, because I always time it to make sure. But it's no longer it's like usually 15 to 17 minutes when I have somebody new. But once I got a whole group there and everything and they know what they're doing, it takes about 12 minutes. So anybody listening or if you know anybody that's like looking to get stronger and faster and a little bit more like pliable and dynamic, um, make sure to share this video and share this this um, in this episode. But but one thing to consider here is that he just said that his warm up was 12 minutes. When you're working these systems, you do not rush into them. You know, your body requires to be the hyaluronic acid and the fascia requires to be warm. You know, the synovial fluid in the joints, they, they just need to be warmed up as well. All the soft tissue that the nervous system needs to be primed, you know, as they say, grease in the groove in terms of like waking it up. And and all of these ideas need to be touched upon to, to properly ensure that you're not going to get injured when you're challenging some of these more dynamic movements. So before I come on a podcast again, they have to come and do at least a warm up with me at the gym. Yeah, all I right. would like that. <laughs> Deal. Yeah, absolutely. So okay, I'm so I need about thirty-five minutes to to do one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I mean, think about it. When a kid comes to me, they're coming from school, so they like this all day. Yeah, mm -hmm. just sitting. Or, or if a person is coming at work all day, and so I have to, like he said, get the fascia moving, getting everything, getting that uh, whole the whole system of everything just moving. If not, they can come in there and they can end up injuring themselves because they didn't. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. I am very prominent. And when someone shows up late, if you show up 12 minutes late, you, you, you can't. Uh, I'll see you at the next class or tomorrow. I won't even let you work out. Oh, no, I'm fine, coach. I can. No. I, you, yeah, you're not that's awesome that you yeah. do that. No, you're not allowed to work out. And I tell the parents that, too. <clears throat> and so I had some parents do it. And so I said, listen, if you miss a unexcused session, I'm charging you $25. And you lost a session. So please show up on time. Respect the time that you paid for. Respect my time and make sure that you're there. It's on my wall, real big and red writing, punctuality. Be there on time. <laughs> yeah. I like it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, <clears throat> you know, as we're kind of rounding third in the episode here, um, any last little tidbits that you think uh, our listeners should know about, like with regards to speed training and strength training and some of your expertise? 
Um, just like speed training, you want to be fast, but you have to take your time. When you're training yourself to be fast, you have to take your time. You have to be patient. That is the biggest thing that I have to teach sprinters is to be patient and to be confident. They, they are the most unconfident people that you've ever come in contact with sprinters. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then once you get them to understand what they're capable of, they become more confident. And then you will get yourself a no allows. That's well, what, you're bringing up a good point here. And we were talking about this in a couple, a couple of our episodes. It's like, everybody will go, Oh, I don't like Noah. He's too cocky. And I'm like, no, he's actually not. Noah's awesome. We've seen him in yeah. the medical tent. He he's sat with us. And he literally talked. just hangs out and talks. He is not cocky. Now, some of the other spinners aren't that way, but Noah is specifically not. He's just confident. He's extremely confident, mm -hmm. but he is not cocky. Yep. So, I mean, you, you look at it in those aspects that you have to be, I, I want the kids to have a confidence because then they're able to perform well when they're more confident. Mm -hmm. But the things is that I'm teaching them, teaching them speed is, that's, that's easy. Mm -hmm. My hardest part of coaching any athlete is from the neck up. It's yeah. teaching them how to be confident, having that faith, believing in themselves. Though that is the biggest thing that I really have to teach them and get, once I get them there, oh, the sky is the limit. It took me most of my son's life for me to get him to be confident his senior year. No, I, I can attest to that. I, I remember seeing him come in as a different athlete that final year. Mm -hmm. Like the way he talked about his workouts, the way he talked about his training, his races, he, there was no fear. It was awesome. Yeah. And so, and, this, and like I said, this is my own son that I raised. And so to get him to be that, get that confident and his times just dropped. And he just like, I don't think he really lost until he got to like regionals and state. And then he, he also competed at the national level. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and then he's, he's at Ashland University right now. Um, he's on scholarship at Ashland and um, trying to see if, you know, how well he <laughs> performs there. But, yeah. uh, you know, when he <laughs> first heard it was like, like his dad, <laughs> his first hurdle race, he came in dead last place. <laughs> I was like, oh no, we can't have that. <laughs> Gotta do something different. He was five stepping trying to get him. I said, I'm gonna teach you how to four step so you can get over this. And so that's what he did. Oh my phone. Come on, wife. And so <clears throat> and so uh, with that being said, he he just came into his senior year, like, I really want to be good. And this was before senior year. So this was June after he got done with regionals. Mm -hmm. We did, we did, we did workouts. Um, we, we did um, heel workouts. So I went back to what, what I used to. Yeah. So we did heel workouts really fast. Did you go back to the same hill? No. <laughs> I, I, I actually took him to uh, Garfield. Oh, okay. Yeah. You have, you know Garfield Hill? Yeah. Mm -hmm. right no, which really stretch are you Garfield talking about? Hill. Took him to the Garfield Hill, you know, the winding hill. Yeah. So that, that through the park. Yep. Okay. So so he he was like right there. And uh it was I would do 350 meters, 250 meters, uh 90 meters like that, and had him doing those hills. And he was really he was really running them fast. He was yeah. rocking these hills. Mm -hmm. And then I'll have him doing, you know, some hurdle techniques and things like that. And then I will have him do the the sprints to get him up to. He got up to uh I think uh almost 22 miles per hour. And so he was yeah. really, he was rolling. He was doing, I said, so I seen this year he was going to come in. I knew that he was going to do very well this year. What's the fastest speed you've ever seen in your, in your gym? 24 miles per hour. Who got to 24? Uh, Tony. Tony did. <laughs> Tony got up to 24 <clears throat> miles an hour. Yep. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, real quick. What's, what's like a 30 second thing that you can say, about motivating somebody when they are kind of in the dumps when you know their training hasn't been going or they're coming off of an injury and they don't you've talked about like you know it's a slow progression and obviously like when performance is increasing that's a good motivator that's something that builds confidence but how do you build confidence in somebody if they're not hitting the times that they they yeah. want to what's something real quick that you typically help with that athlete to get out of their mind well, the thing is, is that when, first of all, I have them write out their goals. And once they write out their goals and that they're not hitting those goals, then we have to reevaluate those goals according to their ability. And then once I reevaluate the goals, let them understand, like, let's hit this first, let's do this first. So I give them reachable goals. Mm -hmm. 
I, I kind of trick them into understanding that they need to get more reachable goals so they can feel better about themselves. Mm-hmm. And that's the, that is the number one objective that you feel better about yourself. And then really the sky's the limit once you believe. Mm-hmm. We talk about, you know, we're, we're all Christians here. We talk about the Bible and how Christ got people to believe in their healing. We call it miracles. Not one time that I hear Christ call what he did a miracle. Yeah. He always said, according to your belief, according to your faith, you are healed. You have accomplished this. So that still is today. He Mm -hmm. said you would be doing greater things than these. So how would he say to us that we would do greater things than these unless we would? Only according to our belief. Mm -hmm. So I have to get them in some way, form or fashion to be be able to have faith and belief in themselves. For you will get all these things that you first seek ye the kingdom of God, right? Mm -hmm. But the kingdom of God is where? Within. Yeah. So I have to believe in myself. I have to believe in what I can do and my capabilities. So you then find something that they can be successful at. Like when I get a kid and I start go, taking them through different evaluations, and I know that this kid is a better, he'd be a better 800 meter runner, but he thinks he's a 100 meter runner. Yeah. So he's not hitting those times. So what I do is I get his speed tolerance up as high as he can, and then I put him inside the slow heat of the 800. And I tell him, just jog behind these guys and sprint on them at the end. And he does that. I had a kid do that. He ended up running 210. He was like, oh, I'm not beat them guys. I said, I think this might be your race. Yeah. He ended up running 159 indoor and getting sixth place in the indoor state. Meet. That's awesome. He thought he was a one 200 meter sprinter. Yeah. And so you have to find out now if the kid is not hitting their times, is that truly their discipline? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Or do I need to find another discipline for that kid? Yeah. Because everybody's not 100 meter, 200 meter runner. Believe that. <laughs> oh, oh, I know that. <laughs> All right. So you want to basically, you want to find their niche and what they truly can be successful. Yeah. And I think that's a great, great thing because that goes back to the confidence component. And then, you know, that goes back to the positive feedback side of things as well with regards to managing athletes and, and changing the goalpost a little bit based on, on what their gifts and talents are. Yeah, absolutely. Because if you sitting up there, you get a kid come in, I want to run 10, five and a hundred. And you're looking at the kid like, okay. <laughs> and then you do his first trial run and he runs 13 oh, seconds. I wonder speed. how he would look if we said we wanted to run 10, five. <laughs> <laughs> and you then just then, walk away. <laughs> and then I look at the kid and, and I'll say, my first question to every single kid when I'm coaching them is, do you want to achieve greatness? Do you want to be great? Yeah, I want to be great. I said, remember what I said, do you want to be great? So I get a kid, like I said, like that one, that I was running next. I said, remember when I actually wanted to be great? I said, yes. I said, I got something that you can be great at. Are you willing to do it? Hmm. So now you got to move up to the 800. Or yeah. you got to move up to the 1500. Hmm. Well, case in point of one kid that I had who was running the 1500 and the 800, I said, you got to move down to the four. He's like, but I've been running this all. But he was so twitchy, but he didn't know it. Yeah. He ended up breaking the school record at Warrensville, running 49 flat. Dang. That's pretty awesome, yeah. actually. <laughs> and so, and he was, in, 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 in the 1600, he ran 430. And in the 800, he ran 203, 202. And all this life, they just had him running. I said, yeah. I said no, this kid is faster than that. Right. Because those are still decent times. Yeah. And, and I can see why they kept him there. But, yeah. you know, and then, took, so, a, took a coach like you to be able to recognize that potential. And so, because I take every, every kid through the sprint, sprint, sprint protocols, plyometrics, everything like that. And then how I really got him to believe it, I put him in a four by two and he, uh, he led off the four by two in 22 seconds. Dang. I said, it's pretty cool. I said, no, nah, no, nah, you <laughs> move you down. Yeah. <laughs> and he ended up going to the state meet that year. And that was my first year at Warrensville. Yeah. That was my first year at Warrensville. He was a senior. He was like, I've never been in state meet or I get to the state meet. And I said, okay, I'm gonna get you to the state meet. That's your goal. Let's get to the state meet. But you got to do what I tell you to do. Yeah. Do everything I tell you to do. I'm telling you, you'll get to the state meet. And so he was like, you know, I'm, a, I'm probably the 800. That's my favorite yeah. event and things like that. You know, what's interesting is is part of why you're so successful with regards to managing these athletes and managing kids, you know, the general public and the morals all the way to NFL players is that you have such confidence in your ability to coach these people. And I think that just comes down to your knowledge with everything. and 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 how you're looking at the body from a 10,000 foot view and and you're approaching it from a, a very unique perspective not all strength and conditioning coaches are doing that mm-hmm. so where did this 
this, you know, as we kind of round third in the episode here, where did this come from? Like, where did this passion come from? Okay, so this passion came from a 14-year-old boy. I was city champ, like I said, in eighth grade. And I was going to uh, ninth grade. <clears throat> and my coach, uh, we were doing stairs inside. West Tech, now lofts um, on West 93rd. We had to run from the bottom of the basement up the stairs, across, back down, and we had to do that. The first time I did that, I had on a pair of Chuck Taylors. You know, Chuck Taylors, no support, no <laughs> nothing, right? Might as well have been bare, running barefoot. And my knees swelled up like balloons. I'm like, I never hit an injury before, never hit nothing. Why is my knee swelled up? Because I mm. never did that type of volume ever before in my life. That's the most volume I ever did going upstairs, downstairs, or whatnot. And so my coach said, you need a good pair of running shoes. I said, well, um, I was a welfare kid. I was on welfare. We got food stamps, stuff like that. I got one pair of shoes a year, and it was them Chuck Taylors. That's yeah. what I wanted. <laughs> <laughs> I was waiting. Where my mama's bed come set up, brother. Ain't nothing else coming out of there. I come back on Monday. My coach has a brand new pair of Air Max, hmm. and he gives them to me. And I said, why? He said, because you needed them. And I said, well, how, how can I pay you back? He told me, he said, don't quit. Oh, nice. So right then, the way that I felt, I wanted to be him. I wanted to be a coach. Mm -hmm. Now, at 14 years old, I knew that I was going to be a coach. That gave me my passion behind it. So kids, buying kids shoes or getting things that kids need, things like that, that is a part of my coaching. I make sure that they get whatever they need. You know, the plenty of times I done paid out of my pocket for kids to come and get their yeah. money from you mm -hmm. because I want to make sure that I give everything the kid needs in order for them to be successful. Yeah. I don't want them to have no excuse. So that's where my, my passion came from. So I first started doing this, I actually started doing this for free. I was doing it on the side and a parent told me, you're too good at this. You need to charge. Yeah. And then I just started charging and then I was just had some people on the side. And then I decided that I didn't want to work at Chrysler anymore. I was working at Chrysler like 14 years. And I just said to myself, I said, man, I want to do something else. I, I don't enjoy this. I don't like it. I was paying the bills, but yeah, I just don't like it. And then well, I you said, felt led to right. do something else. Yeah. And so then my passion was me coaching, me training kids. I said, but how am I going to turn this into something that's going to help, you know, feed my family? Because I was married at the time. <laughs> you yeah. know what I'm saying? And, um, <laughs> So when it came about and um, I started Gain Speed Performance Academy, my pastor, Pastor R.A. Vernon, said that I can use the back of the church to start training, you know, kids and things like yeah. that or whatnot. And that was a blessing in itself. And so, and then I'll tell you the other story on how I ended up opening up this gym four years ago the next time. <laughs> nice. All right. Well, any last tidbits from either of you guys? I think this was a great episode and I think we're... Um on a topic that we haven't touched on yet on this podcast over 20 ish episodes mm -hmm. and that's uh running fast <laughs> and yeah. speed and mm -hmm. sprinting so uh thanks again for joining us and if anybody has any questions or concerns we'll uh, field them your way absolutely thanks again coach All right, thank yeah. you